Hello, hello. Well, thanks for that kind introduction. It's really a pleasure for me to be back in Austin after all this time. You know, as you can gather, I've been here for almost ever. It seems I came here actually before I was even in college. Uh, I had the benefit summer after my junior year to take a science course here in biology, actually, and just learned some marvelous things about biology. Mostly I had the chance to work at a lab, which really hooked me, you know, the chance to really figure out how the scientific method works and how you can make your curiosity be something more than just an idle thing that keeps your brain busy all the time, but actually channel it to do useful things and fun things as, as, as well. Worked really hard in a biochemistry lab with, with Barry Kiddo. And um, because uh, rather than just doing basic science uh, type um, protein chemistry studies, uh, because uh, my family had had a a lot of experience with cancer. My mother died of lymphoma when I was young, very young. And shortly thereafter, two of her uncles, two of my uncles, her brothers died, one of lymphoma, one of, sorry, melanoma, and the other one of lung cancer. And later on, my brother died of metastatic prostate cancer. And my other brother and I have also both had prostate cancer. Anyway, it's been a big thing in my family. And, you know, for the reason I thought, if I'm going to study something, I want to study something eventually, maybe. I can uh, do something about that, although that's not why I started doing it. I started doing it because uh, I was working on cancer projects, had some success, uh, but I took this course in, in immunology. I think everybody now, after COVID, knows about B cells and antibodies and how they protect you. Everybody in this room has probably had 100 to 1,000 infections of some sort or another over your lives, most of which you don't even know anything about because your, your immune system protected you. Or you may have gotten a little sick and it won eventually, and then you're immune to re-challenge with it. And um, that's, that's a really beautiful thing. But the immunology course that I took, the last lecture or two, uh, was about this new type of cell that had just been discovered called a T cell. And, uh, and it was very different than B cells. And you know, all, all the professor could teach us was, well, these are cells that go all over your body looking for stuff. They go through the blood, they go through the lymph, they go through the tissues, and they just look for stuff that's wrong and recognize it, and then they can kill things or, or you know, make other substances. And I, and I thought, that's incredible. How does that work? And, you know, basically, when I went to see him, he said, we don't have a clue. We don't know anything. We don't know anything about that. And I said, okay, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to work on. So I decided that's where I was going, you know. I was a protein chemist, though, really far from immunology. Well, not that far, maybe, but so. Uh, but I was having a good time in Austin, you know. I mean, the music scene was just starting to take off. Anyway, reluctantly, I moved to San Diego um, to a very famous immunology lab there to try to, you know, learn something about the field. And the most important thing that happened there, though, was I fell in with, uh, I played the harmonica over the years just for fun, but I fell in with some Texas ex expats that I met at, the, met at the beach in La Jolla. And uh, these guys had a band, uh, Clay Blaker and the Texas Honky Tonk Band, you know. So I hung out with them for a while, started playing with them regularly and ended up uh, being a part of the band and playing at, uh, at a variety of uh, clubs that you probably wouldn't want to go into unless you... <laughs> and in the course of that, I got involved in the music scene a little bit. I don't have time to tell the story, but I ended up at a at a party when Willie Nelson and his bass player were there, when Willie got his platinum record for, at the record uh, convention that year for Redheaded Stranger. And I was at the party, it was just fell into talking with them. They said, oh, you live here? And I said, yeah. And they said, do you know where we could play music tomorrow night? I said, well, yeah, it's talent night at the Stingery. And I was supposed to be down there playing with the guy, but you know, you want to come? And they said, sure. And so anyway, I picked him up and took Willie and his bass player down there. And, sat in one song and he, they played the rest of the night. It was amazing. I didn't have to buy a beer at that place for the next two years, you know. <laughs> but anyway, back to the lab. So I was, I was, I, I was working pretty, pretty hard too. And uh, the band decided they were going to move back to Texas and, you know, start playing the dance hall scene around Green and, you know, and, and look at Bach in that area. But I said, now nah, I better keep my, my day job for, for a while. So. I stayed and I had enough done. I uh, got a job offer at uh, a new lab that MD Anderson, you know, part of the University of Texas system by then, was starting in Smithville, the UT Science Park. And uh, the, there were two things that were really wonderful about that job offer. One is that uh, it was a new thing and there were only six faculty. They really didn't really have a clue as to what they wanted this new place to do. And I figured I could do whatever I want, you know. <laughs> I'll fool them. I'm going to just work on T-cells. They didn't hire me for that because I don't know anything, you know, but, but, uh, 
And I read the literature, there, it was all confusing, and I said, people were smoking stuff when they wrote <laughs> some of that. So anyway, so I just said, okay, what, is it, what should it look like? What should this molecule look like? And as a protein chemist, I just, in my mind, developed what that protein ought to look like, and spent about a year and a half working at the bench with a couple of technicians who worked with me, and finally found this molecule that fit all those properties and wrote a paper said this is the T cell receptor. Of course, it was profoundly ignored by everybody. For, you know, nobody ever heard of me, and, and uh, nobody had ever heard of the science book at that time. But luckily, some of the bigger labs that had been chasing activity but not structure saw my paper and used some of the reagents they had made and found, yes, they found exactly the same molecule. And so instantly, you know, I moved to, you know, everybody I was going to all the meetings. People said, well, how did you do that? I mean, let's collaborate. Um, in any event, that led to me getting a job offer at, at, um, at Berkeley. Uh, so I went to Berkeley and uh, stayed there for 20 years, a place much like Austin, uh, full of you know, students, bright people all over the place, seeking knowledge, smart, throwing out ideas, challenging ideas. You know, it was a wonderful place to be. Yeah, so this shows, this shows a T cell. This is just something in, in tissue culture, T, a tumor cell rather with little T cells around it. And there's after the T cells punched a hole in it. So that's what T cells could do to a tumor, just completely kill them right away. But how does that work in an animal? So that was what we were working on for a long time. So I'd solved the structure of this T cell antigen receptor, which is like the ignition switch, you know, but there's more to it. We quickly found out that wasn't enough. There was another molecule that was needed. It was called a co-stimulatory molecule um, that only certain, T cell, only certain cells could turn on, but it's like, we showed it was a molecule called CD28, and if you had to get a signal through CD28, the same time as the T cell receptor to get the T cell to start dividing, that turned on a program that makes the T cells start dividing because you've got, already got about a thousand billion different T cells in your body. Well, each of them has a different receptor, um, each class of them. But you need thousands to hundreds of thousands to go out and attack anything. So you've got to go from those small numbers to huge armies to do it. And this is what turns that process on. The ignition switch is the antigen receptor says, there's something here, CD28 is the gas pedal, it says go. And you've got to get those signals to get going. But then you have to stop it. And so the next thing we showed after a few years was there's another molecule called CTLA-4 that's turned on. When you turn on CD28, it eventually stops the T cell because you have to stop that proliferation or your immune system will kill you. And we showed that by genetically inactivating the gene. And if you don't have CD, CTLA-4 mice, you get immune responses, but it kills them. Anyway. So what does that have, have to do with cancer? Well, I thought about all this for a while and began to put it together. And along the way, we had discovered um, that tumors don't have the ability to push that. They don't have the thing that pushes all the gas pedals. So I formed this idea that what happens is the tumor is invisible to the immune system because they could give the ignition switch, but you know there's no gas. When they, so they, they're invisible. Until they get big, they die, they cause inflammation, cells of the innate immune system come in, they can give that second signal. They redisplay the tumor antigens, turn on the T cells, the T cells proliferate, expand, and go out and kill, start trying to kill the tumors, except CTLA-4 is turned on and stops them. And I had the idea, well, maybe it's a race, and if the tumor mass is too big to get, for you to get enough T cells to totally wipe them out, before it's, they're turned off, the tumor wins. So let's just block that activity, um, that stopping, but with an antibody, just keep CTLA-4 from binding what it binds, and just let the, you know, disable the brakes, let the T cells keep going. Anyway, the long and short of it was this worked in animal models, we could cure. We never found a, a, a transplantable tumor line in mice that we couldn't cure, either with just a t that treatment or a um, combination with chemo. The thing, the thing about chemo and radiation or surgery, uh, they're not curative unless you get every last tumor cell, because as soon as you stop giving the drug, as soon as you stop um, giving the radiation, you know, they're killing the tumor cell. If you haven't killed every last tumor cell, you didn't cure the patient. But with the immune system, you can give the drug, you get T cells, you've got them for the rest of your life. You know, the drug could go away, but you've still got the T cells. And they could come and you know, attack the tumor if it comes back. And we showed that in those mouse models. You could challenge them with tumors for a year afterwards without any treatment, and they'll just reject it. So we tried for three years to get this into people, 
and couldn't because everybody said, oh, that'll never work. You're not attacking the cancer cell. This is some kind of voodoo stuff. And finally, a buddy of mine had a company that uh, um, he had a, made a mouse that made fully human antibodies and replaced the mouse genes with humans. So we made a fully human antibody, and that enabled us to go into the clinic. And in very early clinical trials, a number of patients with metastatic melanoma, very lethal, skin disease uh, responded, you know, three out of 15 in the first trial, the patients had objective responses and, and were cured. One of them um, is shown here. Uh, this was a woman that I know quite well, I didn't know at the time, Sharon Belvin, was 22 years old, just finished college, and uh, she didn't respond to two chemotherapies, didn't respond to radiotherapy to her brain to that. Um, she uh, came to Sloan Kettering, where I was at the time, I'll get back to that in a minute, but um, so she went on th th one of the early trials of my drug, um, which is called ipilimumab, believe it or not, I don't know why. You know, I was at Berkeley when I had been in it, and, the, and after the company told me that the Food Drug Administration named it ipilimumab, I said, well, that's, why don't they at least put an H in front of it? Because it was admitted at Berkeley, you know, but they decided hippie little mad would not be a good name <laughs> for a cancer drug, I guess. But, but in any event, Sharon got one, got actually three doses of the antibody. You can see on the left here, uh, those lesions or, or melanoma tumors in her lung. Um, and after the treatment, they're completely gone. Um, and this shows her brain lesion there, which after the treatment was completely gone. And that was in two, sorry, 2004. Um, and this is 2016, where she's now gotten married, had kids. Um, and uh, she's still doing fine. Uh, we got, over the years, we got to be good friends. So she went to Stockholm with me for the Nobel Prize uh, with me and my family. And uh, anyway. And, uh, and, and, and she's, she's still doing fine, you know. And anyway, so in 2011, the Food and Drug Administration, in the meantime, I moved to New York because, you know, this was a new drug treatment, new treatment for cancer. As I said, everybody was trying to kill the tumor cells before. I said, ignore the tumor cells. You know, we're treating the immune system. So this could work for any kind of cancer. You know, it doesn't matter. And because it starts with killing cells, it would, if you prime an immune response with chemotherapy or radiation, and then you come in with this, you could give memory to those other treatments and make them permanent instead of just temporary. Anyway, a lot of benefits. So anyway, it's approved by the FDA in 2011. Uh, I mean, any doctor can give it, you know, and insurance has to pay for it, more importantly. Uh, for melanoma, and at the time, melanoma was the median life expectancy after diagnosis was seven months, and fewer than five percent of people, fewer than three percent of patients were alive five years after diagnosis. With my drug, twenty percent of patients were still in a trial of five thousand people. Twenty percent of patients were alive at ten years, and many of them are getting to twenty years now. A second uh, checkpoint uh, came along. You know, twenty percent. You know, sounds. Depending on if you have melanoma, that's a pretty good number. If you, you, know, you don't, you think, well, that's not very good. Well, anyway, the second, one of the reasons is there are other checkpoints besides these, 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 CTLA-4 is the main one. There's another one called B7 that Hanjo in Japan found after our clinical data came out. He shared the Nobel Prize with him. If you put those two tr drugs together, in melanoma now, 60% of patients are alive at five years after treatment, and it's still going to be going out for a while. So we can now cure over half the patients. This is percent of people alive versus time. If you could move the median over a few months or so, that was enough to get um, drugs approved by the Food and Drug Administration because, you know, you're adding hopefully quality life to people a few months which is worth something and, and, you know, sharing with their loved ones or staying alive till the next drug comes along. But what ipilimumab showed is you could do that. What we did was we had moved the median survival of melanoma over from seven months to about 11. But the thing flattened out, the survival curve after about three years flattened out at 20%. So, you know, if you made it, three to five years, you were good to go for a decade and more. I mean, there's no evidence that people are, are gonna, they're gonna die of something else if they make it, probably if they make it past five years. So that's called a survival tail. 
And so now the whole goal of cancer research has changed. We're trying to move that median over, we hope, to try to do what's shown in the red line here. I wish these were data, but this is aspirational, to move the tail of that curve up as high as we can get it. Um, now right now, as I said, uh, metastatic melanoma is about at 60% on that line, it looks like. But what we're doing now, my, my, my uh, partner and, and wife actually is, is a, an oncologist. We run a lab together at MD Anderson where we're trying to work and we're studying now, not in mice so much anymore, but from patients taking samples of their tumors when they're on treatments trying to, we, we, we know now the cellular molecular aspects of the immune responses that are important. And we know it can be done and we can then look at tumors with new combinations and stuff and see where we're getting. We know kind of where it needs to go. But anyway, I moved back from Houston to New York to do this, and there's some benefits in that. One of them is um, that uh, <laughs> there was an article about me in a paper, and, uh, and um, I've lost track. I, I mean, I still saw Willie all the time, even when I was in New York, but um, I sort of lost track. But uh, uh, really playing with him and stuff until his harmonica player, Mickey Raphael, sent me an email. He saw an article in the paper and he had lost a family member to cancer. And he saw someplace where I really liked the band. So he said, come and play with us sometime. And so they contacted me back in 2018 and they were playing, they were in Houston playing at this little club in Stafford called the Redneck Country Club. And so and they asked me to come down. So I sat in with Willie that night and that's Willie and, and my wife and I were after playing there. And, I also had the good luck to play with uh, Willie at the Austin City Limits Festival here a couple of years ago. And I've also had time to develop my own band. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this rock and roll and blues band. We're all, all oncologists or scientists at MD Anderson. <laughs> and uh, we got another band called the Checkpoints, which plays national band. We played at Buddy Guy's and place in Chicago, but this is the Texas band we play around for cancer charities and stuff. Still having a good time playing music, having a good time doing science, and uh, it's, it's a good life and a lot of fun. I can't believe they pay me money to do it, but there they are. <laughs> so, so thank you very much for your patience.